You can be seated. It is Mother's Day, and I'm going to have you turn to James 1. I'm really not going to do a, quote, Mother's Day message. I'm going to preach something uh, in our series. We just started the book of James last Sunday, so I want to continue that series in James, um, keep working our way through. And it is great, though, Mother's Day. I appreciate all of our moms out there. My mother, I'm sure, was watching the 930 service in Missouri. Um, she's almost 88, and she is still young and beautiful to me. I tell you, she is... Uh, independent, lives by herself, uh, goes to church, watches me online, and still drives. That's a little bit, eh, but still drives and uh, independent. Let me tell you, she's independent. She's a beautiful woman, and I'm so thankful for my mother. Really am. Thankful for my wife. My wife raised up our three boys. Now we have three grandsons. What an incredible mom. What an incredible wife, very thankful to her. Uh, man, there's just, she's the glue that keeps it all stuck together, let me tell you. And I'm very, very thankful for Denise. She's in children's ministry right now serving and, and uh, just very thankful today. feel overwhelmed with thanks. How many of you feel thankful today? Say amen, huh? Amen. Would you guys agree it's a good thing to be thankful, amen? amen. Yeah, yeah, a lot better than moaning and groaning and complaining, right? But uh, James 1 is where we're going to be this morning as we continue through this book. Uh, this is a subject that affects all of us, uh, not just moms, it affects everybody. And that's the subject of temptation. Um, just make sure you're awake out there. How many of you have ever been tempted to do something wrong? Raise your hand. All right, just want to make sure everybody's awake. All right. As James writes this letter, you remember, you remember who he's writing to, right? He's writing to believers in Jesus, Christ followers who had encountered intense persecution for their faith in Jesus. Many of them had to flee their, for their lives. They had to leave their homes. They lost everything. And so he's writing to encourage them. Remember last week we left off in verse 12? And remember how he encouraged them? Look at that with me, verse 12. He encourages them that there's going to be a reward if they'll stay faithful and love Jesus. He says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. That just means trials. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So he encourages him. He says, guys, stay faithful. Keep loving Jesus because there is going to be a reward from the hand of Jesus one day if you'll just stay faithful through all your problems and trials and temptations. And then look at verse 17. He encourages them in verse 17 by reminding them of God's goodness and God's unchanging character. Look at verse 17. He says there, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and it comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no change or shadow of turning. So what he's basically saying is he's, he's, he's reminding them everything they had was a gift from God to begin with. You know, their home, their possessions their jobs, their minds, their health. He says all of that was a gift from God to begin with. And he's like, God didn't quit being good because they were encountering trials and, and problems and persecution for their faith. And that may just be something that maybe you're here today and you needed to hear that. Just maybe, maybe that one thing you needed to hear is that, you know what, just because we have problems and just because we go through trials that doesn't mean that God has, has stopped being good. I want to submit to you this morning that whether it's whether you know things are great and going my way or whether things are bad and they're not really going my way, I want to submit to you that our God, our Heavenly Father, is still good. He's always good. And everything I have is a gift from Him to begin with. So if He takes it all tomorrow, it was His to begin with. And so He reminds them that God is unchanging in His character. God is good, he's always been good, and he always will be good. And then look at verse number 18. He reminds them of this. Verse 18, he says, of his own will, he brought us forth with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So what he's reminding them there is their secure position in God's family. And um, when he talks about he's brought you forth, it's the same idea of being born again. You've probably heard that phrase. And all that, that's not, that's not anything spooky or weird. 
being born again just simply means, okay, I was born the first time physically, but then I was born spiritually when Christ came into my heart and life, and now I'm part of God's family. I'm part of the heavenly family. I have been born a second time. I've been born again into God's family. And so he reminds them of this, that you have a secure position in God's family. And you know what that makes me think of, guys, is that this world can take our health, our home, our money, our possessions, our freedom. But there's one thing that Satan and this world system cannot have, and that is our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen? Can't have that. We are in Christ, the Bible says. They can't take that away from us. But James is concerned about these people. He's like a spiritual father to them. Remember I told you Adam Levy is like a, a spiritual son to me. I'm so proud of him yesterday when he graduated and we went to Jacksonville and watched it. It was awesome. And he's like a son to me. Well, these people were very dear to James. In fact, he calls them beloved brothers. Uh, uh, here in just a minute, we're going to see that James refers to them as his beloved brothers. How many of you have a sibling, a brother or sister? Raise your hand. Okay, it's one thing to have a brother or sister, but are they beloved brothers? <laughs> are they beloved sisters, right? So he's close to these people, and he's kind of worried about them. How many of you ever worry about your kids? Raise your hand if you ever worry about your kids. Some of you are like, man, I'll be glad when my kids get grown up and leave the house so I won't have to worry about them anymore. Good luck with that. Let me know how that works out. Because we're empty nesters and we still worry about our kids. I, you never worry, you never quit worrying about your kids, right? Uh, my mom's 88 and she still worries about me and my two brothers. I know because she tells me. She'll call me up on the phone. I'm worried about your brother. I got one brother who's 65 and another one who's 63. And my mom's 88 and she's, I'm worried about your brother. Which one, Mom? <laughs> Both of them. And when she, then she calls them and tells them, I'm worried about your brother down there in Florida. You know, it's just part of being a parent. You worry about your kids. It doesn't matter how old you are or they are. You just worry about your kids. And James, these are like his kids, spiritually. And he's worried about them. You can just sense it. You can just feel it as we get into this. In fact, look at verse 16 and notice what he says to them in verse 16. He says... Um, he says there, do not err, my beloved brothers. Now, that, that word err is an interesting word. Um, to, to err means to roam from safety, truth, or virtue. It means to wander. It means to stray. How many of you have noticed it's kind of easy to stray away from God? Have you noticed that? It's easy to stray. It's easy to wander off from where we should be. I remember as a kid, I talked about Mother's Day, made me think of this. I was telling my wife about this this week. She laughed because she knows me. But uh, I was nine years behind my next oldest brother and 11 years behind my oldest brother. So I, I came along a lot later. Mom was a little older. And I know this is really hard for some of you to believe, but I was a handful as a kid. <laughs> I was energetic, inquisitive, and I was a handful. And I remember my mom taking me to the store, and I would err. I would wander off. I would stray. And I can remember the first, I was just a little kid, and I can remember the first few times I, I got scared when I couldn't find my mom, and I cried, you know, and, went, and, and all that. And then, though, that was only the first couple times, because after that, I kind of learned the routine. And I kind of learned that when I couldn't find my mom, I would just find a worker. I knew what to do. I'd go find a worker. I'd tug on their pants, and I'd go, I lost my mom. And the worker would be like, oh, you did? Did you wander off from your mom? Mm-hmm. Could you announce on that loudspeaker that I'm lost? <laughs> I remember, I'm, kill I'm not kidding you. I did this all the time. I would always get lost in the store. And then pretty soon, they'd tell, come on with me. And they'd take me to the front desk. And pretty soon, over the loudspeaker, Sally Proctor, your child is at the front desk. Sally Proctor, your child is at the front desk. You know, and here she'd come, Danny, I told you not to wander off. And I was a handful. And, and I would err. I would wander off. I would stray. And that's what that means. And he says, do not err, 
my beloved brothers. Please don't wander. Please don't stray away from Jesus. But these people were under a lot of pressure from the enemy. And so James was afraid they were going to crack under the pressure. He was so afraid. He was afraid they'd give in to temptation. That they would think that that would make them happy. That would solve their problems if they just give in, you know. And so James reminds them in the text we're going to study here in a minute. He reminds them of the nature of temptation and what it brings. What happens when we stray from Jesus. When we stray from God and from his truth. And so we're going to study this. We're going to look at this this morning. Uh, We left off in verse 12. So we're going to, last week, so we're going to pick it up here. He kind of shifts. There's a shift here. Last week we talked about finding opportunity in your problems. And that was all verses 1 through 12 about, you know, about, about all the things that, that can happen and how we can end up growing and developing as a person and how our prayer lives, you know, can grow. And we can grow in that relationship with Jesus when we go through problems. But then he kind of shifts, though, because there is, there is a potential when we go through problems and through trials and through temptations to not grow, but to actually, it can in, end up being very counterproductive. And so he kind of shifts here, and look what he says. Look at verse 13. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. No, he says, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone. He says, but each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. In your handout, I've got mine here, I hope you have yours. The first point there about about temptation is that temptation begins, he says, with an alluring lust. That's how it starts. It begins with an alluring lust. Give you a second to write that in. You know, it's funny. Whenever people are tempted and we mess up, we want to blame somebody, right? We, other than ourselves, and that's just human nature. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, right? We want to blame someone, and some people blame Satan. Oh, Satan! You know, the devil made me do it. But then other people, he knew they'd be tempted. Maybe human nature would be for these Christ followers to actually blame God. If they succumbed to the persecution, the pressure, compromised their faith in Christ, he knew the temptation may be for them to blame God. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that people even today would actually blame God for bad things in our life? Would people actually blame God? Oh yeah, people do it all the time. They blame God for even the temptation to do evil, like God somehow orchestrated it, you know, and, and I mean, I've heard this stuff, you know, God, God brought this other person into my path and, oh, I mean, it, it was a God thing. It, it was just, it was like that we, I, he brought this person into my path and there was this instant connection that we had. And, and I know it had to be God. I mean, when you look at all the circumstances, it had to be God. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I cheated on my spouse and, and I committed adultery, but it must have been meant to be. When you look at how everything happened, it must have been meant to be. It, it, amazing, isn't it? In other words, the idea that they're trying to get across there is that God is up in heaven orchestrating all these events down here to happen. So ultimately, yeah, it's kind of God's fault that I sin. And by the way, that there's a, that's a philosophy of life called fatalism. And that's, you know, fate. People talk about, well, it was fate, right? It was meant to be. It was fate. It was destiny. It's all saying the same stuff. It's fatalism. It's this idea that there's this pre-planned thing, pre-plotted out plan for your life, and you're just kind of like a puppet that's just kind of like, uh, you know, playing out the script. But it's fate. It's destiny. You know, that's fatalism. If you look it up, you can study that. Some people live by that philosophy. Then other people bring fatalism into religion and into the into God. And they'll be like, well, you know, God planned it and God willed it. And some people believe, I'm telling you, there are churches that teach that God planned and he willed even your sin. God planned and willed for you to do it. You're just a, a puppet playing out the script. And so James makes it very clear In verse 13, look at it again. Verse 13, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, it is to me. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. 
He says, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone. So James makes it clear that the temptation to sin and to do evil never originates with God. It is never, uh, and, I, and I hesitate to, to use this term in my everyday life because of, to me, I hear people use it in a wrong way all the time. You know, it's never God's plan. You hear that phrase a lot. It's never God's plan for you to sin. In fact, uh, there's a, an example in Jeremiah 32, 35, where the nation of Israel, they're supposed to be God's people, right? And they are actually, they got so caught up in idolatry, worshiping false gods, paganism, they were taking their babies and they were throwing them in a fire and sacrificing them to false gods, killing their babies, just, just throwing them in the fire. God was so taken aback by that, this is, this is what God said. God said, which I had not commanded them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. God said, you know what? This, is, this was not part of my plan. God says, no, I didn't will it. I didn't plan it. God said, it never even entered my mind. Which, by the way, that, that's a blow to fatalism. Because, you know, if God pre-planned and pre-plotted out everything, then it had to be in his mind because the whole plan came out of his mind. But yet God says here, the things they were doing never even entered his mind. God does not dangle sin in front of us like a carrot and try to entice us to take it. He says, God cannot be tempted with evil and does not tempt any person with evil. So, that means we can't blame God for our temptation. So then where does temptation come from in our lives? If it doesn't come from God, where does it come from? We've all experienced temptation. I know I have. I still do. Um, you do. We all have temptation. Temptation to say something we shouldn't say. Talk about somebody behind their back when they're not there to defend themselves. Gossip about them. We have temptations to... Um, you know, to, you know, we sung about addictions in that one song and we all ha are tempted to get addicted and not be moderate, but to actually let ourselves get taken over by certain things. And it could be a number of things. We think of addictions as drugs and alcohol, but I mean, there's all kinds of addictions out there, you know, to stuff that we can get addicted to. Um, you know, we're all tempted to say things we shouldn't say, to hate people that we got no business hating, that we should never hate. Um, you know, we've, we've got, uh, temptations, maybe you got temptation to, to steal, um, you know, or to lie, or to cheat on your spouse. Um, you, there's, there's all kinds of, of temptations, and we all encounter those every day of our life. But where do they originate from? James says they don't come from God, so where do they come from? In your handout, it says that James teaches us that these temptations come from our own inner lusts. Now, I want you to look at verse 14. Everybody look at that and let's see how personal this is. If you got a pencil or a pen, you may want to underline a few words, actually. All right. Look at, you don't have to, but you might want to. Look at verse 14. Notice how personal this is. So he, he says, God cannot tempt anyone. But verse 14, he says, but each man. Man just means, that's generic, just means each person. You know, we talk about mankind. We're talking about humanity. Sometimes the Bible will use that in a generic sense. So he's not just talking about men. It's about men and women. And he notice that phrase, underline each man. But each man, each person is tempted when he, he or she, underline that word he, is drawn away by, and then underline this, his own lust and enticed. So I want you to notice how personal that is. Each man, he is drawn away by his, his own lust. So where does it come from? It comes from within us. Temptation comes from within us. Well, that makes sense because that's exactly what happened to Satan. How did Satan become the devil? You know, you ever think about that? Where'd the devil come from? Well, the Bible's very clear about that. The Bible says that he was a cherub. He was an angelic being. He was created good. And here's what the Bible says, how he became the devil. Let me read it to you. Ezekiel 28, God said, you were perfect. Told Satan, 
You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Until sin was found in you. The problem came from within him. It was his own personal pride and thirst for power that caused him to become the devil. So, we got that down, right? Have you, have you all got it? Say, got it. All right, so our temptation comes from inner lust. What's a lust? A lust is a desire. That's all it is. A lust is a desire. So, some of you in here, I've noticed you've got coffee. And I am lusting after your coffee. I'm desiring it. <laughs> I could use a cup right about now. It's my third time to preach today. I could use some coffee. <laughs> so I'm lusting after your coffee. The word lust in the Bible usually speaks of wrong desires, but the word just means desire. But usually there's a connotation of a wrong desire, a lust. So he says, look at this again. Look at verse 14. He says, each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. And you know when I read that, when it says he's drawn away, do you know what I ask myself? Drawn away from what? This is, okay, you're drawn away of your own lust and attack. Drawn away from what? And so I looked up the phrase drawn away, and in the Greek, that is a hunting term or a fishing term. It carries the idea of drawing the prey away from its hiding place or from its place of safety so you can kill it, shoot it. So what is our place of safety? What's that for us? If we are drawn away from our place of safety and shelter, what would that be for us? Well, the Bible is very clear, and, and it speaks of God as being our strong tower, our refuge, our shelter, our place of safety and security. Would you guys agree God's our place of safety? Amen? In fact, look in your handout. Boy, I love that verse, uh, Psalm 18 too. That's a good one. If you're ever praying to God and you just want to praise him, that's a good one to praise him with. It says, the Lord is my pillar and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. He's my shield, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Amen, church? <laughs> Woo! Proverbs 18.10, look at the next one. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it. We run into that refuge of God, right? The Lord and notice, what does it say at the end of that? We run into it and we are what? We're safe. God's our place of safety and security. So when I'm drawn away, it means I'm drawn away from my place of safety, from God. Did you know that the words of God are said to be a place of safety? Did you know that the words of God are said to be a light to your path to keep you safe? Look in your handout at Psalm 119, 101. He says, I have restrained my feet from every evil way. Why? That I might keep your word. It's the word that keeps me from my feet from the wrong way. Look at the next one. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Look at this next one. Hold me up. God, hold me up and I shall be what? Safe. And I will have respect for your statutes, your words continually. So, in your handout it says, temptation comes when we allow inner lusts to draw us away from God and His words. Away from light into darkness. See, if you look up here, let's, let's say this drum set right here is, is God. And I run into Him and I'm safe in Him. And I have His words to, sh to lighten my path, to keep me on the right path where I can be safe and secure and, and find shelter. And so here's what the Bible's saying. Here I am, safe and secure in God, but when I, but my inner lust, I've got this, you know, these, these sinful desires and lusts. And if I'm not careful, those inner lusts can draw me away. Remember the idea of drawing away is to draw away the prey from the place of safety. And so, so what happens is I'm drawn away from that place of safety of God and his words. And I'm drawn away and then I'm out here on my own. And guess what? I'm a sitting duck. Do you know where the phrase sitting duck comes from? Hey, what's harder to hit? A sitting duck or a flying duck? <laughs> For me, it'd be both because I'm a terrible shot, okay? 
But yeah, the idea is a sitting duck is still easier to shoot, right, than a flying duck. And so when I leave that place of safety of God and his words, I come out here and I'm a sitting duck. I'm ripe for the picking. Another way to put it, picture a fish, right? And he leaves that place of safety and he comes out and he sees that, that juicy worm. And it's just dangling there. He doesn't know there's a hook underneath it. And so so picture that, that when I leave God, when I leave God, when I leave that, that, that refuge, that place of safety of God and his words, and I come out here on my own, I'm like that fish going along, and, and there's this, this, this bait, there's this thing that looks so great, and I end up with a hook in my mouth, rolled in cornmeal, deep fried, and on somebody's plate, <laughs> ready to be devoured. And that's what happens. And that's what he's saying in James. That's exactly what he's saying. Don't, don't say when you're tempted that God tempted me. No, he said every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And the word enticed, guess what? That's also a hunting term. It carries the same idea of entrapping the prey. So temptation comes when we're deceived, we're led away from that place of safety by our own inner lust, our own inner desires, and entrapped. Let's go to the second point. Number two, the second thing we learn here is that lust eventually, those inner lusts give birth to sin. In verse 15, he says, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. So, temptation begins with inner desires that have gone astray. We haven't actually taken the bait yet. We haven't, we haven't, you like those sound effects? But boy, it sure looks good. And so we reason, man, it'll feel good, or it'll make me happy, it'll fulfill me, it'll satisfy me, it'll make me popular, it'll give me power. And so those inner desires, those inner lusts, eventually turn to outward action. Lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Well, Jesus taught the same thing. Look in your handout real quick. Look at this. Uh, hopefully you turned it over there and saw this. Um, all right, Matthew 15, 19, Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immorality, thefts, false witness, which is lying, and blasphemies. What does that mean? Out of the heart? Out of the heart I lie? Out of the heart I steal? Out of the heart I, I commit um, adultery, sexual immorality? What does that mean, out of my heart? What he's saying is, those actions originate first in our minds or hearts, synonymous. And notice the first thing on the list is evil thoughts. It all proceeds from that, evil thoughts. We are enticed by the thought of it. You ever been enticed by the thought of something? And then we lust and we desire it in our minds. Come on, you guys all know what I'm talking about. How many of you ever thought, I'm going to watch the waistline, I'm going to cut back, I'm not going to eat any sweets this week. And then all of a sudden you remember there's chocolate cake in the kitchen. How many of you, be honest, how many of you, there's, you've, you've, you really didn't want to do it, you didn't want to eat sweets, you're trying to be good, but you remembered a chocolate pie in the fridge or a chocolate cake in the kitchen that someone gave you or some chocolate chip cookies or something like that. How many of you have ever laid in bed at night, determined you're not going to do it, but just thinking through what the chocolate cake would taste like? You ever done that? I have. I'm laying there in bed, just mulling it over in my mind, what it would taste like, what it would feel like, you know, on my lips and, and in my mouth and how it would taste. And, and I'm, I'm just imagining it. Let me ask you something. If I, if I lay in bed and think enough about that chocolate cake, what am I going to do eventually? Buddy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be up to my elbow in chocolate cake, amen? I mean, I'm going to go in there and just, I'm going to just feed my face with it, right? So we all get that. We all understand that when you think on something enough, eh, 
You're probably going to do it eventually. And that's the idea of the word conceived. When he says when lust is conceived, he's using the analogy of a woman having a baby. When lust is conceived, it brings forth. So it's the idea of a woman having a child. And so he's using an analogy. So he says that temptation begins like a seed, just like a woman, right? The seed is planted in the woman. It grows, develops, and eventually she brings forth. Well, what he's saying is temptation begins like a seed in our mind. That seed is a lust. It's a desire for something we shouldn't have. And if we allow the seed to grow... Eventually, it gives birth to sin. We act on those desires. And in your handout, it says we actually do it. So we're not just thinking about it, we're doing it. The analogy that James uses of a woman getting pregnant and giving birth, you know what I like about that analogy? It in first time, right? A woman conceives, right? The seed is planted, she conceives. But she doesn't give birth to the baby right away, right? I mean, hey, you don't get pregnant and then have the baby the next day. Just think about that, ladies. If if that was possible, if you, you know, say if you got pregnant and then had the baby the next day, you could have 30 or 40 kids, no problem. Isn't that a cool thought? Isn't that neat? Some of you are like, bite your tongue. It is Mother's Day for heaven's sake. No, it, time, right? It takes nine months. You see what he's saying, right? You get the analogy here that James is using? When he uses the analogy of lust conceiving inner desires and eventually they bring forth sin? Time. And it's the same of temptation. Some of you are just thinking about it and you've reasoned in your mind, well, I'm just thinking about it. I'm not actually doing it. Right. So we don't usually just wake up out of nowhere and think, huh, I think I'll go to the store and steal some stuff today. We don't usually just wake up and just out of the blue say, I think I'll commit adultery today against my spouse. Right? We don't do that. Usually we think on it a while before we do it. We play it over in our minds. But we reason And say, well, I'm not actually doing it. I'm just thinking about it. And James is like, okay, I get it. But be aware when lust, when those desires, those thoughts, when they, just be aware that when it's conceived, when the seed is planted in your mind, it eventually does give birth to sin. And the day comes when temptation meets opportunity. When those inner thoughts and desires actually meet opportunity and we actually take the bait not knowing there's a hook underneath. And that brings us to our last point. Because, you know, again, I don't know, maybe we're all at different points here, but but the last thing here, number three, that I want to share with you from the text is that sin, when it's finished, results in death. If you look at verse 15, everybody go there and look at that with me, verse 15. He says, then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, that in first time. But then he says, sin, when sin is finished, It brings forth death. All right, so look up here a minute. When a woman conceives, eventually she gives birth and it brings forth life. And we we experienced that recently in our family. Clayton, our son, up here who was leading the music today. He he and Elena uh, conceived, brought forth a son, Cyrus. And boy, he has been such a blessing. She conceived gave birth, and it brought forth life. And it's such a blessing. We love baby Cyrus. He says, though, but when lust is conceived, those inner desires that, have, that are drawing you away from Jesus, he says, when lust is conceived and when it finally gives birth, it brings forth death. It's not a blessing. And the temptation for these believers would be to compromise their faith to relieve the persecution and get the material things back that they lost or possibly preserve their life. So James reminds them of what lust and sin lead to. 
He says they don't lead to life. Lust and sin doesn't lead to life. It leads to death. You know, and, and we're all familiar with the verse Romans 6.23. I mean, not all of us. Some of us are familiar with that verse. Do you all know what Romans 6.23 says? It says, for the wages of sin is death. What are wages? Wages are payment owed. And he says that the payment owed for sin is death. Okay. I think sometimes, though, we don't have a real good biblical grasp of words in the Bible. We just kind of think we know what it means. Oh, yeah, death. That's when you die and you go in the grave or you're cremated or whatever. But it, it's actually more than that. Death in the Bible, in your handout, it says it means separation. Death means separation. That, that's really the deeper meaning of the word death. Death is separation. Okay, so, for example... Go to James 2, verse 26. Go to the last verse of James 2. So flip forward to chapter 2. Go to the last verse. Great example here of death meaning separation. All right, look at it. It says, James 2, 26 says, As the body without the spirit, so the spirit has been separated from your body, so now the body is what? It's dead. Separation. Your spirit separates from your body, your body is left dead. So faith without works is dead. So death is separation. L listen, when your spirit is no longer within your body, it's been separated, your spirit leaves your body, you're dead. You're physically dead. Now think about this. Here's your spirit. It's not annihilated. Your, I mean, your spirit is what animates your body. It's who you are. So your spirit now is over here, doesn't have a body anymore, right? Left your body, so your body's over here dead. But what about your spirit over here? Well, the Bible says that, you know, what we want is we want our spirit to be in God's presence. But sometimes if we, if we don't know Jesus, what happens is your spirit is separated from God's presence, from, and God is life. He's light. So here you are over here, if your spirit... If your spirit is separated, say that's God. Remember we said, okay, that's God, the drum thing, here's God. All right, then if my spirit's over here and I'm separated from God, I'm separated from his presence. God is life. God is light. So I'm over here in darkness now. What does that mean? It doesn't mean I'm annihilated. It doesn't mean I, do, I don't exist, but I'm spiritually dead. I have been separated from God's presence. We are separated from his presence. That's called the second death. First death is when your spirit leaves your body, separated from your body. You're physically dead. But if your spirit's separated from God's presence, that's a second death. So death is separation. Sin leads to death or separation, James says, even for believers. And again, I'm not... Follow me now here. I'm not teaching that if you're a believer in Christ that you're going to be separated from God's presence. Once we have his presence, we have it. What I'm saying is this, is that sin, remember this statement, sin separates. I want you to write that in your handout. Sin separates. And that's what death is. It's sin that separates marriages. Let me ask you some. Can two believers end up having their marriage fall apart? Yes or no? Oh, yeah. Why? Because sin gets in there in one or both parts and sin separates. It kills. It kills marriages. Sin separates. It'll kill friendships. Sin separates churches. It'll kill churches. Sin separates siblings, family members, children, and parents. Sin brings separation in any culture. And it's sin that separates us from everything good and everything life-giving. Remember last year I talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And we went through all nine. What, do you all remember that? How many of you remember me going through the fruit of the Spirit? Awesome, awesome. You guys remember. That's awesome. 
So last year we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. You remember the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? Patience. It's that gentleness, that meekness, that humility. Oh, it's all that good stuff. Self-control, faith, right? All the good stuff. Goodness. Fruit cannot grow in an adverse climate, can it? No. A believer cannot grow in the fruit of the Spirit when the soil of our heart is tainted by sin. And that's what James is getting across. James is saying sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. And he doesn't just mean you're going to be in a grave or be cremated. That's not what he's saying. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. In other words, in your handout, it says sin separates us from the life-giving fruit of God's Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 says it this way, quench not the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. And you know what I think of when I think of that? I'm going to come this way and grab this. I brought this in from the house, and it's just a piece of a hose. And, uh, you know, in Florida, we got the sun and all that, and boy, stuff, man, it needs water or it's going to die. How many of you have ever... uh, how many of you ever gotten frustrated because your, your hose got knotted up, huh? And boy, that, that hose will get knotted and no water's coming out, you know? And if no water's coming out, the, the ground is, is dry, it's hard, and nothing can grow in that kind of heat and that kind of climate. Nothing's going to grow there. You got to get some water on that stuff. My wife was frustrated this week because flowers she'd put out, you know, was dying because of the lack of water. She said, I got to get more water on this stuff. But if the, if the water hose is knotted, you're not going to get that flow of water that you want. And that's exactly what sin does. It, it knots the hose, so to speak. That's exactly what he's saying. Sin knots the hose. And it, sin creates an environment that stifles spiritual growth that stifles the life of Jesus, that stifles that life-giving flow of water from the Holy Spirit inside of you. And what happens is just like grass and plants will shrivel up and die, we kind of can begin to shrivel up on the inside when we allow sin to rule and reign our hearts and not not up. The life-giving fruit of the Spirit cannot be there because that requires the water of the Word and the water of the Holy Spirit flowing in our life. And sin knots it up to where we can become dry and barren, thirsty. And you know, sin makes big promises, man, doesn't it? Sin says, man, I'm going to bring you happiness, fulfillment, pleasure, popularity, friendship, power. Wisdom sees through those false promises and says, nope, I'm not going there. Not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. I am going to allow myself to unknot this hose in my life. Because some of you, that's where you're at right now. And you know what? We've all been there. I'm going to unknot that hose. And I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit of God to flow in my life. I'm going to, I am going to walk with Jesus and I'm going to love Jesus. And I am going to try my best to keep that hose unknotted so that the life-giving power, the life-giving fruit of God's Holy Spirit can flow in my life. Because you know what? I don't want to be knotted up. Because when I'm all knotted up with sin, then that life-giving flow is quenched. It's stifled. And, and now all of a sudden it affects my relationships and, and, and it affects my marriage and it affects my friendships and it affects my church life and it affects my passion for Jesus. It affects my witness. It affects me in so many bad ways when I allow it to get all knotted up like that. I want to keep that water flowing freely. And you know what? I don't know where you're at right now today in this message because some of you may be in that first point there where, you know what? You're just thinking about it. You've just got some inner lust and desires that you're thinking about, you know, and, and, and you I'm just thinking about it. And you're like, but I need to get off of that path. I need to get off of that in my life. That's not where I want to be. And man, we've all been there. We've all struggled. We've all been there. You know, and some of you maybe are at that second point where you've actually been doing it. I mean, you actually, you thought about it. And now, you know, it's like we've talked about, we're kind of entrapped now. We're maybe in bondage. Maybe we're really struggling with some stuff. Well, we all do. 
you know? And, and, but it's, it comes from our own inner lust, and we have to make a decision. And sometimes it means getting some help, talking to somebody. Do you all agree that church ought to be a place where we ought to come, be real, share our struggles, and then know that when we share our struggles, people are going to come alongside us and say, hey, man, I'm going to help you through this. Amen? Not find judgment, but find help at church. So many times it's like people, oh, I can't believe he's doing that. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't believe you're doing that. I mean, we could do that all day long, right? Let me tell you something. If you look under the hood of everybody in here, I don't think any of us would show up at church next Sunday, amen? <laughs> you know, it's like, how's that going to help? By talking about somebody. Man, isn't church the place where we ought to come? And where, where if somebody's like, man, I'm struggling with this. And you know what? I didn't want to do that, but I, I'm, I'm doing this. And, or I'm struggling with that. Or I'm struggling with my tongue. Or I'm struggling with this addiction. Or I'm struggling with that. And, and I'm struggling with anger. Or I'm struggling in, in my marriage. Or I'm struggling with this or that. And man, church ought to be the place where we ought to be able to come alongside each other and say, man, brother, listen, I'll help you. I'm there with you. Man, I'll help keep you accountable, but guess what? I'm struggling with some stuff too, and I need you to hold me accountable. It isn't church the place where we ought to be able to come and be real. Amen, church? That's it. I'm telling you. You need to be able to share that stuff with somebody in your small group or somebody at church. And get, we're here for you. We're not here to judge you. We're here to help you. We want to come alongside you. You know, we got counselors that we are for counseling for free because everyone needs it. And you know what? Sometimes you need that. You need, you need a counselor. You need a therapist. You need someone to help you. You just got to have it, man. God made us to be relational and, and to get that help that we need. And so I don't know where you're at, you know, in your life, but I do hope that we learned in James today that, you know, temptation is real and, and everyone struggles with it and it comes from our own inner lust. And they threaten to draw us away from God in that place of safety. And there comes a point where we can actually get the, the hose all knotted up because we're actually doing stuff, you know, that's just really killing us. And sin brings death. It, it kills everything good in our life. Sin kills that life-giving flow of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our life. It stifles it. It quenches it. And that's why he said in 1 Thessalonians, don't quench the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Because the Spirit wants to produce that wonderful fruit in your life. Would you bow your heads with me right now? And let's just pray. And wherever we're at right now, let's let this passage in James speak to our heart today.